attention to our subject. I will get straight to the point. Um, in terms of the relationship between humans and animals, three models can be discerned in uh, Christian theology. Dominion, stewardship, and priesthood. My agenda here is to critique the unlikely target of the stewardship model, but in order to put the discussion in context, I will say a few words about the other two as well. Dominion is uh, based on the verses in the um, book of uh, Genesis that give man or human dominion over the fish and the sea, the fowl and the air, and the land and what. It is uh, never interpreted, not by theologians anyway, in such a way as to justify wanton cruelty or greed, but the concept uh, does exist, and its interpretation falls, broadly speaking, into two categories, hard and soft dominion, as it were. Uh, hard dominion um, presupposes a strict hierarchy of creation, uh, the Neoplatonic or Dionysian hierarchy of uh, mineral, plant, animal, human, angelic, with the man very much at the top of the material creation. Um, it also presupposes an absolute metaphysical divide between humans and animals, as well as an instrumental approach to animals the assumption that animals were created for the sake of uh, the human being and can therefore be used for human needs. Consequently, it also presupposes the priority of, uh, human, of human interests over animal interests. Soft dominion uh, can actually maintain all the above presuppositions, but it stands the themes on their heads, as it were. So for example, it can work with the hierarchy of creation that I just mentioned, but it reminds us that in the Christian setting, the higher serves the lower. The logic uh, being whoever is greatest among you will be your servant. This um, is the basis of uh, Andrew Lindsay's generosity theory. Professor Lindsay argues that um, human morality works on the principle of the ethical priority of the weak as in women and children get in the lifeboats first. So if we consider ourselves to be somehow better or higher than the animals, we should prioritize their interests. In the orthodox uh, tradition, the same uh, idea is expressed in uh, a desert story about the great Russian mystic St. Sergius of Radonezh. St. Sergius had a bear companion who he fed. And one day, when food in the monastery was scarce, St. Sergius was seen still feeding the bear. And he was told, whoever heard of taking a monk's food and giving it to the bear? To which he replied, whoever heard of a bear fasting? The idea being that if we consider ourselves to be somehow better than the bear, we ought to be able to sublimate our um, hunger, for example, into an ascetic practice, whereas the bear would just go hungry and that's that. And uh, the soft dominion blends more or less into the concept of stewardship, that we must uh, love and look after God's creation. Stewardship is the model of choice in a large part of modern Christian discourse and many Christian organizations that champion animal welfare would routinely use this word and really what's not to like. Well, a note of caution, however, is sounded by no less an authority, for the Orthodox anyway, than Bishop John Zizulus of Pergamon. While acknowledging that um, stewardship is certainly preferable to the kind of interpretation of dominion that leads to the exploitation of nature, <coughs> Bishop John nonetheless points out two limitations or disadvantages of the stewardship model. The first one is what he calls its managerial character, treating nature as an object to be managed. And the second one is a conservatist attitude, once again, Bishop John's own uh, term, um, attempting to preserve nature in a given state, um, an unrealistic and in some cases even undesirable project. I will now try to unpack these two uh, reservations because they're not just the theoretical concerns on the part of an eminent theologian, but practical problems in conservation that lead to early and violent deaths <coughs> for lots and lots of uh, animals. So the first one, uh, the first reservation, the managerial character of the stewardship model, leads to the kind of paradigm in conservation 
that kind of rather arrogantly assumes that nature cannot manage itself and it needs humans to manage it. A kind of white man's burden, but in relation to nature. And in practice, it often means killing or culling uh, lots of uh, individual animals who are deemed to be somehow too numerous for the ecosystem for the sake of the ecosystem. The killing is said to be humane because the animals die uh, quickly. I will um, now give you a, uh, unfortunately, typical concrete example of how this uh, conservation paradigm works in practice. We are looking here at freedom of information uh, data on the killing of uh, animals in London's royal parks. We're talking about places like Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens, Regent's Park, um, the, well, some of the most iconic urban open spaces in the world. Places where Londoners and tourists go to relax, to reconnect with nature, and to meet the animals, from the more exotic deer and parakeets to the more common pigeons and squirrels and geese. Actually, these are the most popular animals with the tourists. And uh, the very animals whom the tourists photograph and admire are killed in exceptionally high numbers. These are city parks. Um, the killing is justified in the following way. I'll have to go and read it because um, uh, this is small. Uh, a Royal Park spokeswoman said, the Royal Parks are carefully managed spaces and complex environments inhabited by thousands of species of animals and plants. Over 77 million people visit each year. Maintaining and enhancing a diversity of wildlife is at the heart of our work. It's a very careful balancing act to make sure that the wildlife can coexist and flourish in the park's delicate ecosystems. Without effective management, some species across the 5,000 acres of parkland could fail to thrive or disappear altogether. Our humane approach to animal management also ensures the survival of ancient trees and other rare habitats, which in turn supports a rich variety of other animals. Now, this statement sounds plausible, uh, well, I mean, you may notice the frequency of the use of the word manage in it. Bishop John might be psychic. Um, but it does otherwise sound plausible. However, it is ethically problematic because it rests on at least three questionable assumptions. The first of these assumptions <coughs> is that um, species, ecosystems, and larger communities are more important than individual animals and that individual animal lives can therefore be sacrificed for their sakes. This assumption is questionable because it does not take due notice of animal sentience. After all, the reason animals are accorded moral consideration at all as a separate category is their sentience. And sentience is a characteristic that is predicated of individual animals, not of ecosystems or species. It is not an ecosystem that feels fear or pain, but the individual animal. And so if we start killing individual animals for the sake of whom the ecosystem exists in order to preserve the ecosystem, we are putting the ethical cart before the horse. The second questionable assumption is that there is no difference between our positive moral obligations, what we should do, the do's, and our negative moral obligations, what we should not do or avoid doing, the don'ts. The thing is, animals that <coughs> kill each other they suffer from environmental causes, they outcompete each other. We cannot simply go in there and balance out the ecosystem to stop all that. It uh, would be irrational to even try. It is, however, uh, uh, realistic for us to aspire not to harm either the uh, individual animals or the ecosystem in our dealings with them. And so then, if we start killing individual animals in the name of helping the ecosystem, we are doing something morally counterproductive, because at the same time, we're taking on a positive moral obligation to balance, to manage, that is not strictly speaking ours and not realistic, while violating a clear negative moral obligation not to harm. And the third questionable assumption is that the death is humane if the animals die quickly. I mean, as far as environmental science is concerned, death is not a welfare issue. Well, this leaves unanswered the argument from foreclosed life opportunities for the individual animal. If there is uh, goodness in the animal's life to be had and it doesn't happen, it is, uh, precisely theologically speaking, a serviceable definition of evil. And so, uh, going back to Bishop John's uh, reservations about the stewardship model, it is its a managerial character, I believe, 
that leads to these uh, uh, ethical problems. The second one, the conservatist attitude, is uh, even more serious. It causes a practical problem, first of all, the desire to uh, go back to and maintain some kind of ideal past golden age state of nature puts man on a collision course with nature itself. Nature does not stand still. It changes all the time. It is uh, surprisingly resilient and can even deal with the ecological mess we create, although not always in the way we would like it to or expect it to. And um, this kind of man versus nature conflict is exemplified by the current irrational dislike for alien or introduced species. The mantra in conservation is very much native good, alien bad. This is irrational because it is purely a question of fashion. In the 19th century, the academic fashion was the opposite. It was fashionable to collect animals from all over, well, in, in this case, the British Empire, and to try to establish them on other continents. It was called acclimatization. But now the pendulum of fashion has swung in the opposite direction. And as far as traditional conservation is concerned, alien species are public enemy number one, <coughs> regardless of their actual ecological impact. This costs uh, millions of animals their lives and costs millions in money to the taxpayer, who is forced to pay for eradication programs that target the species that are simply the most successful and have adapted to deal with our, to live with our economic activity and even our ecological mess. In terms of uh, theory and um, precisely theology, this conservatist attitude is also problematic. The idea that we fell from a state of perfection to which we now have to return is not an orthodox one. So Maximus the Confessor, for example, explains this at length. We fell from a state of potentiality, if anything. And so restoring a past golden age, either for ourselves or for the creation that we were put in charge of, cannot be part of the Christian agenda. And this lack of um, theological clarity is, uh, seems to be symptomatic of the stewardship model as a whole, to some extent. Um, I mean, it is certainly better to look after God's nature than to exploit it. Uh, but, um, for all that, the concept of stewardship is theologically almost vacuous. There is a lot of intellectual safety in it, but there is nothing specifically Christian about it. If we engage in conservation activity, even the benign, non-culling kind, we're still not doing anything specifically Christian. Yes, we could be looking after God's creation, we could equally be serving Mother Earth, or following any kind of secular agenda, our actions would be the same. And let us not forget that even if we do manage to stop all exploitation, all abuse of animals, animals will still kill each other and die from diseases. Nature read in tooth and claw has not been abolished in a world created by a loving God. And this dilemma can only be addressed in the third model of how humans relate to animals, the priesthood one. Unlike the intellectually safe area of stewardship, this one is highly speculative, and I am aware, spiritually and intellectually, that I'm entering dangerous territory, and some of you might think I've been in that territory for the last 10 minutes already. But anyway, the need for priesthood has been articulated, uh, most famously by Bishop uh, John Zizulus. And um, uh, I would like to conclude by trying to paint a picture of what that model might look like. I will base what I say on the writing of uh, Bishop John himself, also Panayotis Nellas, Bishop Anthony of Soros, of Modern Thinkers, and uh, <coughs> Dionysius the Areopagite, St. Maximus the Confessor, and the Cappadocians, the usual giants of Christian metaphysics. So one way of introducing the priesthood model would make use of the hierarchy, Dionysian or Neoplatonic if you prefer, hierarchy that I mentioned earlier as in mineral, plant, uh, animal, human. And if we examine each tier of uh, this hierarchy, we notice that we humans are made of the same chemicals as the rocks. We have nutrition and growth like plants. We have feelings and movement like animals, as well as our own specific features. This uh, enables theologians to speak of man as a microcosm. We have in us everything that is found in the rest of creation. We also have our own um, uh, cognitive capacity for abstract thinking, which enables us to conceive of creation as a whole, 
and to refer it to God in the act of Eucharist and receive it back as transfigured life that we can then pass on to the rest of the material creation. In this model, the word priest is used in its immediate primary sense of mediator with the divine. And another way of uh, introducing the same idea would make use of St. Maximus's uh, uh, famous concept of uh, logoi. In his system of thought, uh, there are logoi for individuals, for species, for genera, and they all find their unity in the one logos of Christ. But these are not empty universals. They are, as uh, one theologian put it, invitations to relation. They are something that connects us organically with the rest of uh, creation. We are material objects, we are living creatures, we are sentient beings, etc. Which gives us an ability to recapitulate the world and to provide a link between the material and the immaterial in the grand cosmic liturgy. According to St. Maximus the Confessor, this is our destiny. Which is a very lofty statement indeed. Um, but many fathers, really, from the very beginning of the formulation of classical theology, saw man as a bridge between the material and the divine, which suggests that the priesthood uh, model, uh, although it is, uh, in terms of academic theology, very challenging, it is the only one that can do justice to the subject of who we are and how we relate to animals. Thank you.